We all know that automation is intrinsic when it comes to building any kind of data warehousing or data infrastructure, but just how much is AI helping with the process and how much more will it help in the future? That's what we explore in this week's episode of the Data Radio Show. Hello there, welcome to this week's episode of the Data Radio Show. This time around, Sam's going to sit down and have a chat to Jonas, who is the VP in charge of marketing at VoltSpeed, an organization based out of Belgium that works really heavily within that automation field. They're going to have a little chat as well around how AI is evolving and helping them do what they do best and what some of those outcomes are for end users and clients. But before we get to that particular conversation, don't forget to hit that like button or share button or subscribe button or leave a comment down below. It always helps to feed the algorithm a little bit. All right, now let's jump over to that conversation. Well, hello, viewers and listeners. Today we have a slightly different uh, discussion going on. I'm joined by uh, Jonas from VoltSpeed, and uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about some of the evolution and, uh, shall we say, um, developments that there are in the data warehousing space and, and some of the changing customer demands that VoltSpeed are observing uh, in the marketplace and how they're responding to that. So first of all, welcome, Jonas. How are you doing today? Hey, Samuel. Yeah, thanks. Uh, doing well, doing well. Early morning here in Belgium, I guess a bit later for you guys. Uh, New Zealand, right? So that's, um, that's yes. the, the beauty of these uh, online interviews. No one knows what time it is. But uh, doing well, thanks. <laughs> All right. Um, I, I guess the the world of um, data and AI engineering is is moving at a, a tremendous pace at the moment. Um, I I guess one of the questions that I've got for you are, what are customers? And and when we're talking about customers here, it's data engineers, data analysts, data modelers, etc. What are they coming to Vault Speed and, and asking for that's different to before? Um, I guess they um, they expect more from the automation solutions and from the automation vendors. Um, whereas, um, yeah, before a few years or, or the proposition that Vault Speed really started on was data vault automation, right? And data vault also automation can be used to build a comprehensive integrated layer of all the data sources that you have in your organization. And that's great. Um, it's a perfect pattern. You can automate it very well. So our offerings were based roughly around that. And we also, um, over the years, developed some capabilities downstream into the presentation area where we allowed people to uh, yeah, code their own automation templates, say, for their own business logic or or yeah the modeling uh, that they wanted to apply downstream but um people keep keep asking us more there huh? um focus today is on the data product delivery um especially if you already have a data vault uh, built out then the next step is always yeah how can we deliver our our data products our marts our whatever applications you're trying to to feed with the data how can we feed them as fast as possible uh, with the highest quality possible. So, yeah, we get a lot more demand from uh, capabilities downstream. Um, uh, and also the the way in which we deliver them. Huh? The, the coders are typically happy with a solution where you could code your own templates, but there's a lot of people that are a bit, yeah, refrained by that. They, they, they also want some more graphical capabilities in there. Well, I, I suppose that's one of the things with the emergence of large language models and, and chat interfaces and, and prompt engineering is that there is an increasing um, demand for no-code, low-code uh, types of environments. So I, I guess that might be uh, a dimension to all of this. And I imagine that the, the demand in terms of the diversity of use cases has gone up and there's a, a requirement for greater agility uh, as well in delivering data products. 
Yeah, uh, greater agility, greater speed also. I mean, if you build a data product today, uh, it might be very valuable, but maybe tomorrow it's going to be completely obsolete. Um, and again, if you have a solid foundation there with Data Vault, that's like the perfect, uh, you're set up for success already, but you're not there yet, right? You, um, you need some additional capabilities. Um, and yeah, that's something we have seen. Uh, I mean, the, the, the past uh, five, seven years, let's say, we've been all talking about uh, data mesh and how we should deliver data products um, on a shared infrastructure, but with distributed teams. We don't necessarily have to, um, yeah, have, have to be that tightly aligned anymore. Everybody can do whatever they want. Um, yeah, honestly, it's, it, that has delivered some success, success stories, but not necessarily always. So, uh, that's also why we, um, why we kind of, um, uh, those two streams together, let's say the fact that people ask for more and, and more quick delivery in the, um, in the, the business layers, let's say the presentation, uh, areas is where we, um, where we see also in Volt Speed, where we see two different capabilities and two different products uh, arise. On the one hand side, we have in Volt Speed the, um, the data vault modeling capabilities that we've always had. And we see those work in a more um, uh, a less mesh approach, let's say, a more centralized approach, where a central team could build a foundation layer for, for integrated data across the organization to serve each and every domain. Um, and they could do it and they could keep up with the demands of the downstream uh, domain teams because of automation, because of the fact that they have uh, automation capabilities in place with Data Vault, they can, uh, they can build uh, massive, uh, massive uh, integration layers that, um, that could be placed there as a part of the infrastructure. Um, and by, by infrastructure, typically people mean, okay, we have a database, we have a, an operating system, we have a, a, some other solutions in place, pure from a technical point of view, we have storage, uh, we have a lake somewhere. So with, or with Voltbeat or at Voltbeat, we believe that you want to uplift that definition of infrastructure to already add some business value on top of that infrastructure. That's what makes it valuable. And that's something that a, a centralized team having data vault, having automation can surely deliver. And then on the other side, you have your domain teams, the ones who have to build the data products as quickly as possible. Well, if they can use that shared foundation layer, you already save them a lot of time in terms of, yeah, how do we handle the data delivery, the incremental loads, all that stuff has already been covered. And they can just focus on the business functionality, on the, uh, on the specific rules that can be applied there. And for them, um, we're actually building a new interface in Volt Speed where you could really graphically create uh, among these teams across different domains also. They could create their own shared library of automation templates and of um, business logic to, yeah, to accelerate data product delivery even, even more, let's say. That's, uh, that's what we're working on. So it's speeding up the delivery of business value and of data products to the wider organization? Yes. So the, the, the data domain teams, they could still work separately, independently of each other because they serve a specific domain. But typically, if you, if you have a data demand in a specific domain, the data itself is almost never going to be limited to the domain on itself, right? You might have some use cases, but um, let's say you, you have a marketing team that wants to um, track a bit better the, the profitability or the the way in which their marketing campaigns really matter. Well, they will need more data than just the data about their campaigns and their, their own marketing efforts. They will probably need some data about profitability profitability, sorry, and, and, and other metrics that come in from the, the, the finance department, maybe. So you need data from different domains. So if a, if a marketing data domain team can use an integrated layer where they can find all that data, all those single versions of the, of the facts, really, 
inside that integrated layer, well, then they will speed up their delivery of their own data products tremendously because there's a lot of ground that has already been covered for them and they can focus on, on whatever is important on the definitions by which they want to uh, yeah, see and build their, their new data product. That's the idea. So, so one of the the dimensions of of business value, especially these days, is around um, data governance and data quality. How do the these well this this new approach or this more diverse approach to delivering business value and data products actually also improve your your data governance, your data quality, et cetera? Well, that's, that's exactly one of the things that this approach will fix because those two were the, were, were two, yeah, main issues or problems with data mesh. Data quality was hard to govern because, and, and, and also the governance over what has been built. That was hard to govern because everybody was doing their own thing. They had their own rules, their own hard rules, their own ways of integrating and, and, and looking for the data, other data within the organization. So yeah, how do you apply consistent data quality rules if if everybody's doing their own thing basically? How do you uh, apply or set up uh, consistent governance on the data if everybody's doing their own thing? That's almost impossible. Uh, even more, uh, some regulatory requirements. How do you make sure that within every single data domain, everyone applies by those requirements of GDPR or or the other versions of that that that, that exist around the world? Um, that's almost impossible to achieve. Now, if you have a centralized layer where those things can already be safeguarded, yeah, that makes it a lot easier for your domain teams to safeguard those principles as well. Um, and yeah, in, in terms of data governance, um, my opinion is always, if you want to make data governance possible and, and easier to implement, you have to start with the, 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 uh, yeah, the structure and the the com you have to start by reducing the complexity of your data itself, and that's something you can do by by yeah by integrating it and by having a central team that is in charge of delivering that integration model that adheres to your 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 business model that everybody in the organization should be able to understand if they also understand and 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 work by that same common uh, business model, right. And and what sort of evolution are you seeing in terms of the the demand for data products? So you, you touched on how Data Vault was kind of the central core of uh, an approach, but more recently there there've been um, different schools of thought around the integration or a hybrid approach using Data Mesh and and now Data Fabric as well. Yeah, so um, data mesh is um, has been around a bit longer. Data fabric is a, a principle that has been coined by Gartner, um, and I've seen some presentations on that. Um, honestly, I I kind of like it. Uh, fabric is is organized and centralized around uh, activation of your metadata, um, even to an extent where you would have something that we would call proactive metadata. So metadata that could warn you upfront uh, and, and that helps you make sure that certain things that you don't want to happen are, yeah, you make sure that they just don't happen because you, are, you have like an early warning system for issues and, and, and problems that could arise, uh, proactive metadata. Um, they focus a lot on automation and all those things. So. Honestly, if we if we would combine both fabric and mesh together, we see it more in uh, yeah the, the 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 same way, and it's also an approach that um, that was uh, put forward by uh, uh, one of the Gartner analysts that I saw presenting in uh, in London this year on their uh, their data analytics uh, summit event uh, in May. Uh, they put forward that yeah the delivery of the data, the, the delivery of what we at Volspeed can see as that centralized foundation layer should be built and, and governed more in a, in a fabric approach. Yeah? Automation, metadata, those those terms have to be top of mind there. 
And then the, the delivery of the specific data products then can be uh, set up in a more yeah, mesh approach. Um, and honestly, yeah, if, you, if you map that to the architecture that, that Fault Speed has always recommended before, that could actually work pretty well. Um, and, and yeah, that's how I would, would structure them uh, together. And, and to what extent do you think uh, working with large language models uh, that that's driving uh, some of this uh, more flexible uh, approach to the use of, of data and, and, and how you deliver data products? I think it, it definitely matters. Uh, it, it applies to or it, it's part of the reasons why the speed of um, of the demands are always increasing. Huh? People get new ideas more often, uh, see new potential value drivers more often. And um, yeah, for example, if you would, uh, you have you have several applications today working on more business users could could query data not by writing the standard SQL that we've all been writing for the past uh, uh, 30, 40 years, but um, the actually using plain English to ask a query to a database. Um, yeah, the problem is, how do you structure the data? How do you build your specific data product in a way that the AI application is able to do that in a consistent and proper way? I saw a presentation on uh, Tuesday from someone who had studied a bit on this topic. Um, and, and yeah, he raised a lot of issues and a lot of problems that, that an LLM could have querying a certain data set. Um, let's say you have multiple parts between, um, between two uh, entities. Uh, you have like the delivery address and you have the, the invoice address, something like that. Yeah, if you don't give enough context to the LLM, how is it going to be able to give you the right answer by following the right, the right path down the data model? Um, that's not easy. And I think um, accelerated data product delivery, accelerated structures that could feed the applications in a way that they would hallucinate less often. Yeah, definitely one of the reasons why we why we get more and more demand on the on the delivery side. Yes. All right. Okay. Um... And and maybe to sum it up for for listeners and, and viewers, what three things should they take away that Vault Speed is kind of committed to uh, enabling them to do more more effectively? Um, yeah, we believe that um, it's it's indeed about the delivery. That's the, the most important word uh, that we hear today around the, the office of Voltspeed. So it's about delivery. It's about enabling people to make that uh, delivery happen. And it's also about uh, support uh, from Voltspeed. We've always believed in um, uh, a strong embedded support uh, within our solution that, um, that basically puts the problem on our end if there is any issue with uh, Vault speed uh, templates, for example, for the data vault methodology. That's our problem. It's never the customer's problem. Uh, those kind of things. Because if you go or you, you start following the, the, the path of automation, you've decided in your organization you want to do automation. Yeah, it's not that easy, right? Um, so very often you come across issues um, that take quite a long time to solve if you have to solve them on your own. Yeah, we believe that. Um, some of these issues or a lot of these issues have already been solved by someone before. Um, and, and yeah, people shouldn't reinvent the wheel or uh, do stuff that, that isn't going to bring them direct value. Um, customers of all speed should be able to focus on building their specific business logic, their specific um, uh, yeah, answers to the problems that their business users have. That's what where they should focus on and less on the on the nitty gritty details of delivering data indeed into an integration layer. That's something that we, uh, that we've been doing for the last 20 years. And it's, uh, it's something we want to share with our customer base. So I, I guess, uh, one way to sum it up is that, you know, 
as the demand for data products and and delivering business value increase you you're offering clients uh, a better faster uh, and more cost effective way of delivering that that value and that that those data products absolutely um, and i think in the current uh yeah current economic climate let's say cost effectiveness is indeed also a very very important topic um We've been working a lot around uh, ROI use cases. And the cool thing is that we have a, a track record, let's say, uh, a benchmark database on which we can uh, do some proper calculations there uh, just to see how cost effective it is compared to yeah, building your own automation uh, or other solutions uh, out there in the market. Um, so yeah, that's an important one, but it, it comes also with um, the delivery yeah. cost effectiveness effectiveness is one thing um being part of um of the solution to drive value is another one and if you can do both at the same time yeah that's that's where you want to be right uh, and that's where we always try to be with all so from a market pressure standpoint what what are you hearing from clients and customers uh that they're under pressure to to deliver more and uh at a, at a lower cost or um you know in in what ways are the the screws being tightened shall we say in terms of um cost management i think cost is an important one huh? um sometimes people uh come towards us indeed and um uh, I think it was in, in June, I had a conversation with someone and he told me that they had built a planning and they had put it forward to their boards or their board of directors to to build out a, um, yeah, a data platform, let's say, to serve certain needs that the company really, uh, really needed. And they told them that the entire project was going to take around two and a half, three years. Uh, their board said, well, that's way too long. So either we can make that shorter or yeah, otherwise we're just not going to do it because it's too long and it will cost too much. Probably if you have, if you need to have a workforce uh, build out that thing in, in three years, it's going to be too costly and we won't see the value uh, soon enough. So that's, that's, that was their problem. And. Yeah, their only way out was indeed finding ways to speed these things up, uh, which is, of course, why they started looking into automation solutions. Yeah, I, I suppose the um, the compelling event, as they they talk about in terms of of sales, becomes important. Like it's it's not unusual for projects to not get the funding because they're not the the time to value is too long. And the perceived risk that's associated with not doing it is not that great. Yeah, indeed. And, and I mean, a lot of uh, what we perceive today as value also automatically contains the element of speed. And that's exactly because of the risk, because if I tell you, hey, um, I, I'm going to, uh, let's say I'm a car salesman and uh, you come to order a car in my uh, in my dealership and I tell you, yeah, the car is going to be uh, delivered in two years. And you're going to be like, hmm, the car automatically becomes less valuable to you because, yeah, what the hell, two years, that's, an, that's, an, uh, that's a long time. And second you you al already also perceive the risk of the value it might have when it gets delivered uh, let's say you want to you want to buy a, an electric car there's a lot of techn technological advancements in the electric car uh, uh, industry so if you get a car that was built on paper today let's say with the specifications it has and it will be delivered in 2 years yeah you will have an old car that's that's simple as it is so that's the uh, you could draw that parallel into the the data product delivery business as well. I mean, if I'm going to tell you, yeah, you will have a data product in two years. How, as a business unit manager, 
will you be certain that it's still going to have the perceived value that you think it has today? Yeah. Difficult to say, right? Yeah. And, and I guess this is uh, one of the effects of the widespread, uh, I wouldn't say adoption, but the, the, the use of AI um in and how it's changing paradigms uh around value and perceived value because you know using your analogy or example there um you know it takes two years to deliver a you know a data product that you're starting to see ai models um do similar sorts of things obviously not the same thing but um, in in a fraction of the time, so you know there's this this per, uh, perceived issue. Uh, well, actually, coming back to your point around time is actually part of the value proposition there. That by choosing to do nothing, there's a good chance that some AI tool that's in development at the moment in some startup may be able to actually solve that particular problem in a different way completely in in two or three months time yeah true um on the other side i think a lot of the the discovery of what ai can mean for us is um is still happening um what is um what is interesting to see in the last couple of months you had a lot of uh yeah let's say uh stocks on the stock market uh, related to the ai industry yeah? there's a bit more uh, i think the first um wave of uh hyper excitement was a bit over yeah, the uh, there's still a yeah. hype I, I don't think the hype is over yet which is okay yeah uh, that that means people are still interested and and people still want to learn more and investigate more, but there's some sort of yeah realistic. The more realistic uh, views are also um, entering the 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 entire domain. Let's say like how realistic is it that we can solve this use case or this use case or or, or are there enough use cases that make sense or would have any value today? There are, but. Um, People are, are starting to see also some of the problems more, some of the issues towards um, yeah value, and, and that's what we've seen on the stock market. That's an immediate reflection of that uh, realism that was kicking in, let's say. Um, I had a, a, a good conversation with um, with an analyst a couple of weeks ago, and he's he said that he made a statement there saying that, well, you... We shouldn't try to boil the ocean with AI, meaning that um, yeah, AI can has, has, has applications in which it is very good and where we should definitely use it. But there's also some applications where, um, yeah, where it's probably not worth using an AI uh, uh, solution to, 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 to fix our problem. Um, so yeah, not boiling the ocean and really thinking hard on where it can deliver the most value, I think is an important, uh, important task for anyone who's, um, who's working, uh, with AI and trying to solve problems with AI. Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess it's, it's a tool, uh, that has its place in certain situations. Um. I also perceive that it is uh, altering uh, business models, though. That that's one of the the things that's a little bit different about AI, and 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 I suppose that's true of any digital technology that there has been. That over time, it has altered business models. Uh, that's the whole point of digital business. Uh, so yeah it's it's a question of over what time frame but it is interesting that it it is that we are through the hypes th some way through the hype cycle but i think we're just at the very beginning of seeing what becomes possible using it so yeah i think that sums it up pretty well
Absolutely. All right. Well, I think that's probably a good place to draw a line under our conversation now that we've um, meandered into the in, into one of my pet subjects, which is uh, obviously around artificial intelligence. But um, uh, Jonas, thanks so much for being with us today, and um, thanks so much for your support from Vault Speed. Thanks for having me. Enjoyed the conversation, Samuel. It's uh, great to be on this uh, show. Hey, thanks for checking out this episode of the Data Radio Show. If you've enjoyed this, there's heaps more available on our YouTube page or wherever it is that you get your podcasts from. You can find audio and video versions on the YouTube page and, of course, audio versions across podcast platforms. Don't forget again, like, share, subscribe, tell people all about this particular episode. Until next week, have yourself a fantastic time. Live long and prosper.